All right, we are just past the start time. That's 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time here where we are, so we're going to go ahead and begin. First off, good morning. I'm Erin O'Donnell. I'm the Program Coordinator here at America Makes and your host for today's America Makes TRX webinar series. A little background on the TRX webinar series before I introduce our speakers. As America Makes continues its mission to expand and accelerate the footprint of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, we created this medium called the America Makes Technical Review and Exchange Webinar Series, or TRX. By creating this platform, it allows the additive manufacturing and 3D printing community to come together and share the knowledge and experiences with our broader community. <coughs> If you or your team are interested in presenting during a TRX webinar series, there will be a link to complete um, a form at the end of our series today, or you can contact the America Makes Membership Director, Tiffany Westbay, directly. A few important notes before we kick off the series. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for a brief question and answers, or Q&A. If during the presentation you have a question, please submit it to the Q&A space on your WebEx screen, and we'll ask it during the Q&A session. We will do our best to get all of the questions answered. Um, so today's webinar is on additive manufacturing, advanced manufacturing of materials at Louisiana State University or LSU. I personally had the pleasure of visiting the LSU campus over the summer, and it's a truly remarkable example of how a university is implementing additive and advanced manufacturing. If you ever get a chance to visit, it's completely worth the trip. Um, today's webinar is on, is, with a Demetrius Nikotopoulos and a team of professors from LSU. Demetrius is a professor and chair of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department at LSU College of Engineering. Demetrius joined LSU in 1987 and has been the chair for the department since July of 2012. He is currently the acting director of the LSU National Center of Advanced Manufacturing as well as leads the College of Engineering's Manufacturing Strategic Area. Demetrius holds a PhD and a Master's in Science and Engineering from Brown University and a Diploma in Mechanical Engineering from the National Technical University of Athens. Without further ado, Demetrius, I'll turn it over to you and your team. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the nice introduction. Um, we'll let our uh, team members here introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Les Butler, Professor of Chemistry. I bring to the table X-ray and neutron tomography experience as well as interferometry. I'm Shimin Go from Mechanical Engineering. I worked on laser based additive manufacturing and uh, heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and uh, gas turbine engines. Uh, Michael Kunsari, I'm director of CROM, Center for Rotating Machinery. Uh, my expertise uh, is in the area of tribology and fatigue. Wenjin Ming, uh, professor of mechanical and engineering. Uh, I work on thin cell materials, surface engineering, and micro and nano fabrication. Our recent work has been in small scale mechanical testing, micron scale plasticity, and failure of uh, material, solid material interface. Shuai Xiao, uh, assistant professor in mechanical engineering. Uh, my expertise in multi scale modeling of the mechanical behavior of additive manufacturing metallic materials. All right, so uh, today's uh, uh, purpose is to cover our capabilities here at LSU uh, and also describe some activities and outcomes that are related to additive manufacturing specifically and a few other advanced manufacturing and materials areas. Um, to give you an overview, we'll start with uh, presenting a center-level infrastructure that is related to manufacturing here at LSU. I uh, will describe a major funded project in advanced uh, uh, manufacturing with specific focus to additive. I uh, will describe uh, facilities that are supporting the manufacturing and materials research enterprise at LSU and provide some examples then uh, of advanced manufacturing approaches and outcomes that we use uh, specifically with regards to additive manufacturing and a few others. And finally, <clears throat> we'll conclude with uh, a glimpse to our workforce development program which is project-based, uh, and we'll give some examples that are related to manufacturing and robotics. So uh, our, um, our approach is a strategic one and uh, extends to the level of the state, at least if not the nation. What you see here is uh, essentially the strategic approach of the state of Louisiana in terms of uh, uh, deciding uh, what to actually uh, support and promote 
Um, uh, there is a choice of uh, core enabling science and technology research. And as you see, material science is prominent as well as computational science and bioscience. And uh, tied to that uh, science and technology research uh, are um, high growth target industries that have been identified and advanced manufacturing and materials is an industry sector that is targeted uh, by our state as well as uh, our institution in addition to digital media and enterprise software and life sciences and bioengineering. So essentially additive manufacturing as part of uh, advanced manufacturing is within the strategic interests of the state as well as the institution down to individual departments. So we'll describe quickly some significant center level infrastructure that we have in our neighborhood, starting with the National Center for Advanced Manufacturing. The National Center of Advanced Manufacturing, or NCAM, is a partnership between the state of Louisiana and NASA. It's stewarded by LSU and uh, also has uh, the University of New Orleans um, in New Orleans, Louisiana as a partner. The signature area of NCAM is large-scale manufacturing, um, specifically uh, there are significant capabilities and expertise in friction stir welding, which also has additive manufacturing extensions, uh, as, as well as uh, machine tooling that can handle very large structures. Uh, at NCAM, currently, uh, they are realizing at least uh, a major portion of the of the space launch system, the new space launch system, and um, in addition to the metal-based uh, manufacturing capabilities for large structures, um, there are significant composites uh, manufacturing capabilities. Uh, we see NCAM as a potential platform to transition um, additive manufacturing for large-scale um, applications in the future. Uh, another center level resource is the Center for Advanced Microstructures and Devices, or CAMD. Uh, CAMD is currently the only state funded uh, synchrotron facility in the US, and it provides uh, uh, x rays and related equipment uh, for material science research, characterization via tomography that uh, uh, Les is an expert in, as well as other targeted areas of, uh, of science uh, and technology. Um, we also have uh, a substantial computational uh, resource which is distributed between the uh, high performance computing enterprise uh, at LSU, the Center for Computation and Technology, and the Louisiana Optical Network Initiative, which includes an institute. Um, we, our researchers, have ready access uh, to two petascale um, uh, computational platforms. Uh, for both simulation, but also for uh, big data and analytics. Um, let's now visit one of the, maybe the, uh, our major project uh, that is related to advanced manufacturing and additive manufacturing. It, uh, it is a consortium for innovation in materials and manufacturing funded by uh, the National Science Foundation through the EPSCOR program and also co-funded uh, co by the state of Louisiana and the Board of Regents. Uh, it is a $24 million cooperative agreement um, with duration to 2020, so we're roughly in the middle of its course. And it involves collaboration between several institutions in the state uh, under the leadership of LSU, and these other institutions are Southern University, Grambling, Louisiana Tech, and the University of New Orleans. So um, the um, Consortium, um, in short, SIM, involves uh, two principal science and technology thrusts. The first science and technology thrust focuses on multi-scale metal forming, uh, which includes coatings and interfaces and replication-based manufacturing, which is actually uh, multi-scale. Uh, the second thrust is specific to metal additive manufacturing, uh, both uh, in terms of processes such as selective laser melting, uh, with emphasis on custom alloys, as well as an extension to arc welding uh, for larger structures. The, the general approach taken and the general philosophy uh, with which these science and technology thrusts are approached is one of the, the integrated computational materials engineering, or if you allow me, inter integrated computational manufacturing engineering um, approach, 
and uh, we hope that this will become uh, visible in the slides that will follow. As a note, uh, you will see uh, in the subsequent slides names that are in um, uh, blue font, and those are the names of the individuals that are relevant uh, to each uh, slide, and we will also use the same uh, tagging for the facilities and, and uh, resources that are associated with them. So as part of SIM, uh, we have a core user facilities um, um, group. Um, I've highlighted the three first ones, uh, which are the advanced manufacturing and machining facility at LSU, the materials manufacturing testing and evaluation facility also at LSU, and the shared instrumentation facility. We'll take the time to describe the capabilities of each one. Uh, there's also the Institute for Micromanufacturing, which is a resource a member of the CAF uh, at Louisiana Tech, but we're not going to talk about that today since we're focusing on LSU. So here are the, the a summary of the, our facilities uh, capabilities, starting with a shared instrumentation facility. The shared instrumentation facility, or SIF, provides state-of-the-art materials characterization and microscopy resources and services. So it is equipped with uh, all the uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, SEM, TEM, XRD, XPS, electron microprobe instruments, um, including also uh, focused ion beam um, and Raman spectroscopy. The focused ion beam resource also serves uh, um, uh, nanomachining, as is uh, uh, the argon ion milling capability. Uh, we offer services in sample preparation and uh, comprehensive uh, services involving optical microscopy. Uh, it is well staffed and under the management of uh, uh, Dr. Lin. The Advanced Manufacturing and Machining Facility is a facility that spans uh, both uh, R&D and uh, education. So it is equipped with uh, essentially the standard equipment that one expects from a facility of this type, uh, CNC mills and lathes, which are also involved in our educational programs, uh, large-scale um, water jet uh, uh, cutting. It uh, occupies 8,000 square feet of space and is well-staffed uh, for uh, the purpose. In terms of advanced manufacturing and specifically with regards to additive manufacturing, the facility offers uh, a variety of uh, plastics uh, 3D printing technologies, as well as uh, metal 3D printing uh, technologies, specifically uh, selective laser met, uh, melting process based, and also recently arc welding uh, based, and you see in the images um, the, uh, these machines, um, uh, including the arc welding uh, 3D printer that was developed in-house. In addition to these resources, uh, we also provide services in, that involve micromilling, um, uh, up to five axis micro milling uh, services at spindle speeds up to 160,000 RPM, which allows the use of tooling that is of the order of 10 microns uh, and can achieve uh, uh, features of uh, down to 10 or five uh, uh, microns. In addition to that, uh, we have a large uh, envelope electrical discharge machining, which is used uh, for R&D purposes, but also in our educational endeavors. The uh, materials and manufacturing testing and evaluation facility provides um, a variety of uh, equipment, uh, services, and expertise that cover all the basic mechanical uh, testing, uh, including fracture impact, uh, tensile torsional bending, and also uh, in, um, includes uh, uh, the use of environmental chambers so that uh, tests can be pro um, conducted in, under a controlled environment. Uh, it also has non-destructive evaluation capabilities as well as heat treatment uh, capabilities. I should point out that these capabilities span scales from uh, the nanoscale all the way to uh, what the one would call meso or um, uh, macro scale. Um, some unique resources under the materials manufacturing testing and evaluation facility are electrospace facilities for novel coatings, uh, for example, ceramic coatings uh, for uh, gas thermite applications. 
and also uh, a variety of the reactors for chemical vapor deposition, physical vapor deposition, uh, as well as inductively coupled plasma assisted uh, PVD and, and CVD. Um, recent additions uh, are metal powder synthesis capabilities. Um, this is a facility that allows production of, uh, of uh, powders uh, in small quantities for R&D applications. So it's a small batch system based on spinning electrode uh, principle. We are going to install a caster so that we can uh, produce custom-made uh, alloys uh, locally in 2018. And uh, we also have uh, metal microforming uh, uh, series production, replication-based uh, production um, uh, services uh, under this um, uh, facility. Uh, finally, uh, the, the most recent addition is the um, uh, 3D printer for metals, uh, small scale um, with controlled environment that has been specifically designed uh, so that we can actually um, try the development of uh, uh, selective laser melting processes for custom um, alloys on a small footprint. I should mention that these facilities are all cost recovery centers, which means that they're open for uh, business uh, for uh, outside the customers, including uh, industry. So they not only do they serve the uh, local community uh, within the university, they also serve the broader community, including industry. Um, next, we have the Center for Rotating Machinery. Um, and Mike Consari will um, present uh, the capabilities of this center. Uh, thanks, Dimitris. Uh, Theorem was uh, established 17 years ago. We have significant expertise over 35 years in tribology, which is the uh, uh, science and application of friction, lubrication, and wear. We also have uh, considerable expertise in fatigue and fracture. In uh, additional expertise that we have are in computational aspects of this problem uh, related to fluid solid uh, interactions and heat transfer. In terms of experimental R&D, uh, CIRON is very well equipped uh, with a variety of testing uh, apparatuses. Some of those pictures show what is available uh, in, in CIRON. Uh, we have a variety of fibometers. Uh, these are for measuring friction and wear for different configurations, different loading. We have rheometers for uh, looking at uh, properties of uh, bleeds and fluid. And uh, uh, we are able to do quite heavy loaded uh, and different configuration of testing, including oscillatory, reciprocating motions, etc. Uh, we have developed a methodology for taking into account how uh, materials wear in or break in. We have also developed methodologies for reducing friction via surface texturing. Uh, those are done by laser. Next slide. Uh, the most uh, recent uh, development that we have that relates to uh, generalization of uh, friction and wear assessment includes what uh, the, includes the use of irreversible thermodynamics. These approaches enable us to model and also to assess friction and wear for a variety of uh, uh, situations that are, we believe, all manifestations of the same physics. For example, wear, fragging, and fatigue. The beauty of these approaches happens to be in the way that things are generalized, meaning that they could be applied to a variety of systems without the lack of uh, losing the physics. Next slide, please. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, fatigue, we have uh, extended our knowledge to, of thermodynamics and irreversible thermodynamics to assessing uh, and coming up with the idea of uh, the concept of fatigue fracture entropy. This concept is quite powerful and unique. We have, uh, we have discovered that materials can take a uh, certain amount of entropy, accumulated entropy, before they fracture. It applies to uh, uh, bending, it applies to 
torsion, tension, compression, and multi-axial testing. Uh, and as a result, we are able to uh, put a path forward for accelerated testing. So when a new material is developed, uh, we can very quickly uh, assess its life by doing uh, only a few tests. Also, the evaluation of remaining life uh, and evaluation of structural health uh, in general and monitoring those, those are all the types of things that we've been doing. Next slide, please. Um, so these, uh, we believe, these are of significant interest to uh, uh, additively manufactured parts because before these uh, additively manufactured components can be deployed, one needs to understand the nature of their fatigue and their remaining life. Uh, now, my colleague Les Butler later on will talk about uh, how one can look at uh, the internal structure of the fatigue component biopsy neutron scattering and others that we will talk about. We have recently developed a, a kind of a complementary approach to that as well, where we look at the evolution of fatigue and we determine or we uh, pinpoint the initiation of a crack, whether it's for low cycle or high cycle fatigue, by looking at the surface uh, roughness. And this approach tends to be very uh, uh, powerful and was recently demonstrated in uh, the publication was just approved uh, uh, last week. Thank you, Mike. So we will now focus uh, a little bit more on the metal additive manufacturing science and technology thrust of uh, our SIM project and specifically on the part that has to do with the selective laser uh, melting process uh, and custom uh, alloys. So our, um, our approach, as I said before, is an ICME approach. So in developing custom alloys for uh, SLM processes, we basically have uh, a subtask that involves multi-scale modeling, uh, a subtask that addresses the powder synthesis, basically generating the metal powder that will be then be used during the SLM process or um, other um, consolidation processes. And finally, a thorough uh, property measurement and characterization step of the outcome. And of course, this uh, goes on the on the um, model make measure uh, cycle. Uh, the example that we will have in the next uh, few slides is one that involves uh, high entropy alloys, which uh, typically involve uh, five or more elements in equal or at least near equal compositions. As you see here, we have tagged each one of these uh, subtasks uh, with their relevance uh, to the America Makes uh, roadmap using the, um, the the little icons and the, the subsequent slides will also have these icons uh, so that they can relate to the um, or that you can relate them to the America Makes uh, uh, roadmap. So again, um, talking about alloy making and qualification, uh, it is again the, the ICME inspired cycle. The specific uh, alloy, uh, high entropy alloy here is one that has the composition that you see above it, at least in, in, the, um, in terms of the participating elements. Uh, so we start at the, at the very foundation, uh, subatomic simulation uh, using density fu functional theory, uh, followed by molecular dynamics or coupled to molecular dynamics. Uh, and these simulations uh, guide the uh, design of, uh, of the alloy. Um, there are then calculations um, uh, of phase diagrams uh, that guide the making of the alloy, um, followed by uh, making the alloy itself. And once the alloy is made, there is a battery of uh, uh, tests uh, to examine composition distribution and structure, uh, hardness, modulus, basically mechanical uh, and material properties. And of course, this cycle, depending on, on what is desired, uh, can continue until a, a desired outcome uh, is achieved. We have developed the capability to make a small quantity of a custom components. 
using our current capability, we spin the uh, metal electrode to about 30,000 RPM. We made, let's say, stainless steel and the titanium powders. We also quantified the powder size distribution. We are in the process of developing a new system can spin at a faster speed so we can make a smaller size of metal powders for selectively the melting process. On the computational side, the CFD has been used to guide us the powder making process. Here shows the CFD predicted the uh, powder uh, synthesis process, the breakup of this uh, liquid droplet. Next. And of course, this uh, method uh, is uh, going to be used for the high entropy alloys that we mentioned uh, uh, before. So in terms of the SLM process itself and its outcomes, uh, the associated studies, again, are on a cycle. So we start with uh, some fundamental experiments that explore the laser material laser power bed interaction. Uh, we have an experiment, uh, which is also in collaboration with uh, NASA Marshall, uh, that focuses on measuring uh, the properties of of these uh, alloys uh, in, in molten form, then that information is fed to and, and basically fuels uh, simulations of laser power bed interactions, as well as the SLM process itself. This is in collaboration with Loris Livermore. Uh, we're uh, using uh, their software uh, to simulate the processes that we're interested in. Uh, we also have uh, a study that utilizes uh, the synchrotron at CAMD to uh, perform uh, XRD uh, of the SLM process um, in situ to examine the alloy phase evolution during the SLM process. And finally, the, the 3D printed outcomes uh, are tested, uh, undergo mechanical testing, and uh, uh, then at various stages of the testing, the specimen is uh, uh, subjected to x-ray and uh, neutron scattering uh, diagnostics uh, that can uh, pick up the uh, initiation of, of, of cracks and allow us a glimpse into the uh, material structure uh, during the testing uh, process. And of course, all this is tied together with uh, uh, lifetime prediction uh, based on uh, simulations uh, that start from uh, uh, molecular level and um, uh, involve uh, modeling of, uh, of plasticity and utilize our high performance uh, computing uh, resources. Uh, to better understand the melt pool dynamics and for our custom developed spinning electrode based powder synthesis, a uh, key thermal physical property of the metallic liquids such as density viscosity, and surface tension need to be known. Uh, these properties are difficult to measure and custom techniques are needed. Uh, in this slide we show, in collaboration with uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, we conducted vacuum electrostatic uh, levitation measurements for liquid density, viscosity, and surface tension. Uh, in the process of this measurement, additional data on liquid vapor pressure were also obtained and translated into chemical activities for liquid solutions. These offer thermochemical data that can validate or improve, uh, for, a, for example, uh, phase diagram calculation software. Uh, we are further building in-house levitation capabilities so that we can, uh, in the future, conduct these measurements in-house and use the levitation capability to do a a additional alloy development studies. Next. Uh, so we also build up microscale mechanical testing capabilities, including in-situ SEM testing, uh, and use the capabilities to evaluate quantitatively material spasticity response at the micron scale. Uh, so the pictures show uh, examples of uh, micro shear, micro compression, and micro tension of uh, metal volumes confined between ceramics. And we also are interested in evaluating 
quantitatively failure stresses of uh, metal ceramic interfacial region under different loading conditions. So what Dr. Murray mentioned is part of the effort that we have uh, to investigate, the, to understand the deformation behavior of the metal ceramic interfaces. And that is uh, currently building upon, built upon the uh, framework that we have established. It's uh, essentially ICME framework. This uh, effort goes from the uh, atomic analysis scale that we investigate the, the property and, uh, and structure of the, uh, the interfaces, and then we try to cross that information in the higher length scale uh, dislocation dynamics model. And then eventually, uh, the output of that model will be implemented to a higher length, even higher length scale, metal scale, isoplastic self increasing model. Uh, the, the, the framework has a, it, it, it is a uh, experimentally validated uh, in both length scales, uh, in micro scale as well as metal scale. The reason why this is uh, relevant to additive manufacturing materials is because of the fact that additive, additive manufacturing metals has high density of interfaces. To understand these, the probability of these interfaces is crucial to predict the mechanical, uh, overall mechanical behavior of AM materials. Laser additive manufacturing is a high temperature process. In order to understand the materials, the phase at a high temperature, we apply the synchrotron in situ measurements to find out the phase structure at a different temperatures. Here, using CAMD beamline, we set up a system coupled with laser. We can measure the uh, let's say thermal expansion coefficient at high temperature all the way to melting. We can measure the phase structures at a different temperatures. So we can also apply this system to study the uh, chemical reactions at a high temperature for those high temperature alloys, so let's say corrosion, oxidation, etc. Next. We uh, applied three different neutron imaging methods to look at uh, selected laser manufactured dog bones that had been subjected to tensile or bending stress. And of those three, we uh, first started with conventional tomography, the uh, image on the left, the volume image on the left. But we've been now focused on uh, grading interferometry, which gave us the image on the right. And here we see that uh, a 75% worn sample is showing uh, distinctive features in the scattering image. Uh, this is tuned to about one micron scattering feature size. And early crack formation is evident in this image. Next slide. We uh, performed this experiment in triplicate on another set of samples. Uh, the data fusion of uh, attenuation and scattering is shown in the volumetric rotation image. And then line probes across the dog bone on the left show a feature, uh, again, at the 75% wear, that was then later verified with further wear to be the site of uh, failure. So we're very much uh, 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 interested in pursuing gradient interferometry. We're now a three for three on success with crack formation. So um, finally, we'll reach the end um, with um, a few words about our how we train engineers uh, through our capstone design program. Um, the capstone design program uh, at LSU is one of the oldest in the country. It started in 1982 um, in mechanical engineering, and now it has expanded to other engineering disciplines. Uh, it involves two phases, uh, a fall phase that involves a paper design and the spring uh, phase that involves Reali realization, testing and validation, and demonstration of, final, of a final product. Um, we emphasize both the design process uh, and the delivery of, of an outcome that is uh, uh, compliant with specifications. Uh, typically, um, the majority of our projects are industry funded and inspired, but they're also uh, inspired by our researchers as well as the broader uh, public. Um, in terms of uh, what we offer to our students, uh, our engineering students, uh, in terms of uh, training, uh, beyond the technical uh, skills, um, these, uh, this course sequence and this whole program is communications intensive. Uh, it involves uh, working in teamwork. Um, 
taking heed of economics, management, logistics, documentation, and also self-evaluation of the team members. Uh, it is fully multidisciplinary. Uh, for instance, this year we have 36 projects out of which uh, three quarters uh, involve uh, more than one discipline. And uh, the whole program and the uh, outcomes of the students uh, um, are judged by industry experts, not just uh, uh, professors. We have a numerous uh, industry um, participation here uh, to provide a panel for judging the outcomes. Um, I'll give you some examples of the most recent projects that have to do with additive manufacturing. And we also have right now three or four uh, more projects that uh, are directly related to additive manufacturing. Uh, so the facility that you saw before to generate uh, small batches of uh, uh, metal powders was uh, the initial outcome of such a capstone uh, project realized uh, by the students, including uh, conducting some of the initial measurements. Um, the a multi-metal powder mixing system um, integrated with uh, uh, an OEM uh, SLM system was also developed uh, by our students. And here the intent was to mix powders of different metals to create um, uh, alloy structures on the fly. Um, we also have had projects that focus on the application, basically designed for manufacturing vis-a-vis -vis the 3D printing process. And this team uh, here developed a micro-reactor design uh, specific for additive manufacturing, both in, in plastics and, and metals. Uh, we also have uh, um, used the uh, additive manufacturing more for research purposes. We had a team that created a 3D printed porous medium in transparent plastics in which they performed the measurements of the motion of nanoparticles. Um, the features here that were realized uh, through 3D printing were of the order of uh, 100 microns and sometimes a little less uh, uh, than that. So we kind of pushed the technology to the limit with, uh, with this group. Uh, the uh, arc welding 3D printer that uh, is available in our advanced manufacturing machine facility was also the initial development was realized by a team of uh, students. Uh, they produce some test structures and also do the, did the um, metal graphic characterization. And one of our current projects now focuses on the design of a specific build because that is the most relevant thing to uh, realizing larger structures using arc welding technology. Finally, the uh, electrostatic levitator that uh, Dr. Meng spoke about uh, for in-house uh, uh, measurements of uh, uh, melt uh, properties, um, uh, this was uh, developed, uh, designed and developed by a student team under a capstone uh, program. And this concludes our presentation. Uh, if you have uh, questions, please feel free to ask them online, or if you would like to get more information or ask additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at the email shown on the screen. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Excellent, thank you, Demetrius and team. Um, we're gonna now head into our Q&A session. If you have a question from Demetrius and his team and haven't done so already, please type it into the chat box. So I have a, I have a few questions, Demetrius. Can you tell us a little bit more about your capabilities in custom alloy powder development and why and how this will be impactful to the 3D printing enterprise as a whole? To study uh, additive manufacturing, you have to uh, obtain those uh, custom powders, right? And uh, look at the overall configuration for the program. We have people study the computational side, design the alloys, and we have to be able to make a small quantity of uh, custom powders. Uh, at the moment, we have the first generation of uh, powder making system. It's a spinning electrode design, can spin at 30,000 RPM. We, can, we demonstrated the successful making of titanium powders. However, the size is a little bit on the larger uh, side the average around 75 to 100 microns. Uh, now we are working on a new design, which can spin at a much faster rate, let's say 60,000 RPM. So based on our calculation, 
we should be able to make a high percentage of powders suitable for additive manufacturing. Let's see the powder size within 10 to 45 microns. Excellent. All right, we still have some questions coming in, so I'm going to ask one more. How do you see your integrated multi-scale mechanical testing, structural characterization, and mechanics modeling impacting the 3D printing enterprise? Um, I'll first speak about the experimental stuff. I think uh, recent capabilities in terms of micro to nanoscale machining has really given new possibilities to understanding not only the overall mechanical performance of the materials, but breaking them down into their constituent regions and understanding, for example, how the interfaces perform uh, between these constituent regions. So this would in involve a capability of being able to take, say, for example, ASTM standard mechanical testing on the macroscopic scale and going down to the meso, micro, and perhaps all the way to the nano scale. At LSU, our team has uh, ongoing activities and prior background where we take things like nano indentation, micron scale mechanical testing in different deformation geometries. We're adding capabilities of mechanical tests in different deformation geometries at the meso scale all the way up to the macroscopic scale. Uh, coupled with detailed materials characterization, we believe that this kind of capability on the environmental side would give a much better physical understanding of these new advanced manufacturing materials and coupled to materials modeling. So uh, following Dr. Ron's comments, the current, uh, the, the ultimate goal of this effort would be able to uh, predict the behavior of certain materials uh, that is high, relatively high in density of interface, and ultimately be able to be uh, to be able to design such materials with effective modeling. Currently, we have findings from experiments. Uh, we need to be able to cast these findings into certain models, and but the current available models, they are not uh, especially designed for. Uh, these uh, interfaces. So what we're doing is to uh, investigate the detailed and uh, deformation mechanisms of these uh, interfaces and also the deformation dominated by these interfaces and all the way down to uh, atomic and nanometer scale which we have demonstrated that these mechanisms uh, eventually uh, will govern the deformation behavior at higher length scale. So passing these findings into higher length scale modeling, so, uh, for instance, the micro scale dislocation dynamics, as well as the meso scale uh, viscoplastic uh, deformation, uh, viscoplastic models. And hopefully by uh, devising such a scheme, research scheme, which we will be able to truly realize the uh, ICME uh, of, of uh, uh, this type of materials. <coughs> Excellent, thank you. And we have a question in our Q&A area, and it says, are there limits on the type of powder that the custom LI powder manufacturing systems can make? Uh, at the moment, I believe the system setup will enable us to make uh, all the powders I can think of. We use uh, a thick welded power supply use arc to melt uh, alloys up to uh, 3,000 degrees C, and we spin the electrode to uh, up to 60,000 RPM. Based on my calculation, we spin an electrode to 60,000 RPM for M1 inch rod. We should get a high percentage of powder sitting within the size range suitable for. Uh, selectively the melting phase, the additive manufacturing. Of course, the whole thing setup is such we can make a small quantity of a custom powders. And we also have those unique 3D printer setup 
just take a small quantity of custom powder and then make a small part. So we can do, let's say, mechanical testing to find out the final quality of the 3D part. You can modify, let's say, 3D printing parameters. You can use different powders and to see what kind of product you are going to get. At LSU, we develop the powder system. We develop the 3D printer. I guess they are all come together. Thank you. And I think we have time for at least one more question. The question is, do you have the means to conduct accelerated tests for durability and evaluation of fatigue life for the 3D printed materials? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, in particular, we have demonstrated that for conventional materials, we could do a series of very, what we call a short-term excitation test that would enable us very quickly uh, to evaluate and assess the life of conventional materials. And these approaches, since they're based on the laws of thermodynamics, are quite general. So we can easily extend these to a variety of uh, 3D printed materials as well. By the way, we have a patent on a couple of these approaches for, for determining the life and also the remaining life of uh, components that undergo cyclic fatigue. Well, I think that would lead into our next question then of, do you have the capability and resources to test friction and where under a variety of operating conditions and configurations for 3D printed materials? We do. In fact, we are very well equipped for doing a variety of different configurations and loading cycles, uh, and that is, if you have a component that's very heavily loaded or lightly loaded, or if there are a variety of uh, speed configurations such as reciprocating, oscillating, unidirectional, we are capable of testing all of those in-house. Excellent. I, I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Do you have the methods and means to detect cracks and porosity in 3D printed specimens? Yes, uh, this, is a, this is a method that we have just developed. Um, as I mentioned, my colleague Les Butler discussed how one could look at the internal structure by doing neutron scattering, and we've collaborated on this. Uh, what we have also determined is that one could look at the, without, since these are all non-destructive testing, one could look at the evolution of fatigue through surface finish. These are a manifestation of PSD, the, the uh, persistent slip back. Right. Uh, in which the, the name persistent comes from the fact that if you polish it, they show up again. Mm -hmm. So you could actually put a, a, a profilometer on this and very easily see the evolution and detect when the crack starts. So we have a disclosure, technical disclosure uh, submitted to LSU on this. And we have uh, background work that demonstrates the capability already. If I may add, uh, we're also working towards uh, doing x-ray tomography uh, in situ during uh, mechanical uh, testing cycles as well as um, doing other uh, diagnostics such as SCM in tandem with, um, with mechanical testing on a small scale, of course. Thank you for adding that. I, I'm going to ask one more question. Can you tell us a little bit more regarding the neutron scattering and the X-ray tomography capabilities to characterize the 3D printed specimens? Sure. The uh, neutrons are rather rare in the United States and worldwide. Uh, we use facilities at Berlin and NIST in this prototype work. Uh, we are also engaged with Oak Ridge to help Oak Ridge uh, develop interferometry at displacement neutron source and a hybrid. So that will increase capabilities in the United States. Excellent. Thank you. 
So I think that's going to wrap up our webinar series. I just have one question. Demetrius, is there anything special anyone will have to do if they wanted to come visit your location? Just drop me an email and uh, I'll take care of everything. Perfect. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Demetrius and the team from LSU for showcasing the amazing strides that you're all taking down there. And thank you to all the participants. If you have any further questions for Demetrius, please reach out to him directly. His email is listed there, or you can contact us and, and we'll be able to connect you with him. Um, there will be a post-webinar survey going out to all those who participated. We do really appreciate your time that you take to provide the feedback. That way we may continue to improve and strengthen our additive community. Uh, as a reminder, if you think that you or your organization would be interested in sharing, such as Demetrius and LSU and the, that team, on a TRX webinar series, please fill out the form after the presentation or reach out to our membership director, Tiffany Westbay. Again, I want to thank you all for your time, and it was an excellent information series.